Howdy, I am Landon Elkind. I am an assistant professor of philosophy at Western Kentucky University in the United States of America. I was raised in Texas. For college, I went to George Washington University in DC. And at first I wanted to get a degree in international affairs and pursue a career in either politics or law. That all changed after I took an introductory course with Dr. Michelle Friend in logic. And I decided to change my major that year. I graduated with a bachelor's in philosophy and a bachelor in bachelor's of science in mathematics. My interests then were in logic, philosophy of mathematics and computing, in metaphysics, and in the nature of science. Those remain interesting to me throughout graduate school and they remain my main research interests today. For graduate school, I went to the University of Iowa, working closely with Dr. Gregory Landini, who became my dissertation director. These days I'm collaborating with Greg on a project funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities through a scholarly editions and translations grant. This is the Principia Rewrite Project. This is a scholarly editing project where I'm creating the first textual edition of Principia Mathematica, one that shows all the differences and changes made in the nine editions of Principia that were published in the lifetime of its authors. And this textual edition will also provide the first editorial apparatus for the book, including indices and appendices. But what is Principia Mathematica and why on earth should we care about it? Principia was a book written by two British mathematicians and philosophers, Alfred North Whitehead and Bertrand Russell. This three volume work took them a decade to complete and was almost 2000 pages long when it was first published in 1910 to 1913. And you might be asking yourself at this point, why did Whitehead and Russell do this? Uh, to themselves in part. <laughs> well, there are two main reasons. First, they wanted to support logicism. This is the view that all mathematical truths are logical truths. This is a philosophy of mathematics that scholars, of course, continue to discuss today. And second, Whitehead and Russell wanted to resolve certain logical paradoxes plaguing the foundations of mathematics in their day. They addressed these paradoxes and, so far as we can tell, blocked them successfully by doing mathematics within the framework of type theory. Now, type theories have tighter grammatical rules for making sentences than everyday language does. So while we can apparently say paradoxical things like this sentence is false in English, such sentences or pseudo sentences are classified as not being grammatical or well formed in the logical language of Principia. Type theory was and is extremely important in mathematics and computer science, leading to a host of new and ongoing developments in both theory and software applications. Principia gets bad reputation partly because it develops mathematics in a highly formalized style. Step-by-step -step deductive proofs given entirely in a logical language are not typical in much mathematical research uh, done or published today. But Principia develops large portions of mathematics in this very formalized style to show step-by-step -step, that any given theorem of mathematics can be developed in some purely logical system. And of course they do this for the reason that they want to support uh, the claim that logicism is true. But the style, nonetheless, may feel tedious to professional mathematicians and forbidding to those without training in mathematics. Uh, one person who was not intimidated at all by Principia's uh, highly formal style was Dorothy Rinch. Rinch was Russell's first and only female thesis supervisee. Uh, Dorothy Rinch was born in 1894 in Argentina, which was then under British rule. A few years later, she moved with her parents to Britain. She went to Cambridge University's Girton College, a women's only residential school. Rinch studied mathematics and took the mathematical tripos exam, a particularly difficult test aimed at assessing a student's overall mathematical ability. Rinch won first class or Wrangler status, as they called it, in 1916, a feat that Bertrand Russell himself had achieved 23 years earlier. Rinch then wrote a letter to Russell asking to study logic with him and for his help in securing a Girton College Fellowship to study for the Moral Sciences uh, Tripos. And again, Rinch was here following a path to philosophy from mathematics that Russell had walked some decades before. Since Russell, though, had been dismissed from his lectureship at Cambridge's, Cambridge University's uh, Trinity College on account of his opposition to World War I, they agreed that G.H. Hardy, another Cambridge mathematician, should serve as Rinch's official advisor, but that Rinch should study Principia with Russell as her informal advisor. From 1916 to 1918, Rinch studied Principia in a small private group with Jean Nicod, Victor Lenzen, and Wallace 
Armstrong. Despite Rinch's close association with some of the most well-known philosophers and mathematicians of the era, and despite her eye-catching status as a first-class wrangler, Rinch had trouble finding a permanent academic position. From 1916 until 1942, Rinch held a series of temporary lectureships and research fellowships at women's only, college, only Oxford colleges, uh, but she finally got appointed as a, on a permanent basis as an honorary professor of physics at Smith College, a women's only college in Massachusetts. Uh, Rinch, Rinch held that position for the next 30 years, but you might be asking yourself, how did someone who graduated with a degree in mathematics and then studied philosophy and logic with Bertrand Russell and also studied around other eminent mathematicians and philosophers like Alfred North Whitehead and J.H. Hardy, um, not only have so much trouble getting this permanent job, but also end up as an honorary professor of physics <laughs> um, because that wasn't really the field that she studied in or the field that the folks that she worked with were most well known for writing about. The short answer to this question is that Rinch had the capacity to do pretty much anything and a huge range of philosophical and scientific and technical interests. Uh, she published articles on logic, philosophy, probability theory, biochemistry, philosophy of science and mind, uh, mathematics and mathematical physics, embryology, and even the sociology of parenting. In fact, Rinch was a pioneer of X-ray crystallography and engaged with or against uh, figures including Karl Popper, Dorothy Crawford Hodgkin, Irving Lemur, and Linus Pauling. Rinch's wide range of interests makes her intellectual biography fascinating. I can only scratch the surface in this short video. But thankfully, a Dr. Marjorie Senecal, uh, who knew Rinch personally, has thankfully written a rich, readable, and highly detailed biography about Rinch titled, I Died for Beauty. I highly recommend it for you. If you want to learn more about Rinch, it's a great starting point for both newcomers and scholars and it's a vital resource for anyone who wants to write about Rinch. Uh, how did I find out about Rinch, though? Some of my dissertation dealt with transfinite types and negative type theories, which are type theories that differ in certain ways from Principia's own type theory. Now, I had thought uh, that the earliest known transfinite type theory was from Peter B. Andrews and his 1965 thesis, published later uh, under the title of Transfinite Type Theory. Then, while searching on Google Books for transfinite types and trying to make sure I knew all the scholarly literature on this topic, uh, Senecal's book about Rinch popped up and referred to a thesis that, that uh, Dorothy Rinch had written dealing with transfinite types, quote-unquote. I had to know more immediately, especially if Rinch had not just been a student of Russell who defended, as I was planning to do, technical and philosophical aspects of Russell's logic-centric philosophical project in print, uh, but also, if Rinch had discovered, 100 years before I was working on it, certain facts about transfinite type theory and negative types that I was investigating. Uh, it turns out that Rinch did not ever publish a paper on transfinite types, and no copy of her thesis is known to survive. So unfortunately, we do not know if she worked on transfinite types. But she did publish four papers, four logical papers, presumably in part harvested from her thesis work, uh, on Principia's advanced portions. One of them, in fact, anticipated some of Alfred Tarski's work in 1924 on the axiom of choice. And this was Rinch's six-page 1923 paper titled On Mediate Cardinals. Tarski, in his 1924 paper, proved what we now know of as Tarski's theorem, that if, for all infinite cardinals x, we have x is equal to x squared, then the axiom of choice holds. Tarski, in effect, showed that the axiom of choice holding was equivalent to this arithmetical rule holding for infinite cardinals, because we already knew for Tarski, uh, before Tarski came along that the reverse direction held, that if the axiom of choice is true, then x is equal to x squared for all infinite cardinals. Now, Rinch proved something of a similar nature. She proved an equivalent uh, result to the axiom of choice. But to explain what she proved, I need to make the distinction between different conceptions of finite and infinite. A cardinal is frag of finite if it is one of the inductive cardinals. Think of the positive whole numbers 0, 1, 2, and so on. That's Frege finite. Now, a cardinal is Frege infinite if it's a cardinal number that is not any of those. So it's not 0, 1, 2, and so on. It's a cardinal number that is not any of the positive whole numbers. Now, then there's another conception of finite known as Dedekind finite. The cardinal is Dedekind finite if it cannot have the same size as one of its proper parts. So if you have a collection, for example, of five objects, 
and you take some proper subcollection of it, say something with four elements in it, uh, you cannot put the collection of five things in one-to-one -one correspondence with a collection of, of four things. You can't match them one-to-one -to, -one to each one getting a unique match if one collection has five and the other has four. There's just no way to do it. But a cardinal is Dedekind infinite if it can have the same size as one of its proper parts. So if you take a class of, say, the positive whole numbers, 0, 1, 2, and so on, this can be mapped one-to-one -one with, for example, the even numbers or the prime numbers or lots of other proper parts of itself. So part of the hallmark of being Dedekind infinite uh, is that a collection can be mapped one-to-one -one with a proper part of itself. It's the same size as one of its proper parts, whereas Dedekind finite uh, cardinals don't have that feature. Now, if we assume the axiom of choice, then these two conceptions of the finite and the infinite, the Frege conceptions and the Dedekind conceptions, they actually coincide. So if we assume the axiom of choice, then a cardinal will be Frege finite if and only if it is Dedekind finite. And a cardinal will be Frege infinite if and only if it is Dedekind infinite. But what if the axiom of choice is false? What if it is not true? In that case, there might be so-called mediate cardinals. These are cardinals that are mediate or between the finite and the infinite cardinals. That is, they'll be Frege infinite because they'll be greater than any inductive cardinal. They'll be, they'll be greater than 0, 1, 2, and so on. But they will also be Dedekind finite because they will not be bigger, uh, they will not be the same size as any of their proper parts. So you'll have this these weird mediate cardinals that are Frege infinite, but they're not Dedekind infinite. And they'll be Dedekind finite, but not Frege finite. Now, Principia actually discusses mediate cardinals a little bit, and they introduce mediate cardinals that lie between the inductive cardinals and Aleph Null, the smallest uh, Dedekind infinite cardinal. But all the mediate cardinals, so far as Principia is concerned, are between those two, between the inductive cardinals, they're strictly greater than the inductive cardinals, and strictly less than Aleph Null, the smallest Dedekind infinite cardinal. Wrench, on the other hand, develops the theory, this theory of mediate cardinals in a much more general manner, so that there are mediate cardinals between each and every infinite cardinal, between Aleph Null and Aleph 1, and Aleph 1 and Aleph 2, and so on, including, of course, between the inductive cardinals and Aleph Null. Uh, now, then leveraging her new generalization of mediate cardinals, this new, more general conceptualization and characterization of them, Rinch develops a new theorem, which I suggest we call Rinch's theorem. The axiom of choice holds, if and only if, there are no mediate cardinals. This paper, this little six-page paper from 1923, shows some of Rinch's ingenuity and why Rinch was so good at doing so many different things. She liked to generalize mathematical tools and ideas that she found. She sought new applications of formal tools and methods. She wanted to find fundamental structures underlying one or more branches of science and philosophy. She did this in all the various areas that she wrote on and researched and interacted with other scholars in their fields about. Now, many of the reasons I was drawn to work on Russell also led me to work on Rinch and continue working on Rinch to this day. In fact, I'm giving a paper later this month about Dorothy Rinch because I find her work still insightful and a draw to me. This is, of course, partly because I have many intellectual sympathies with Rinch, just like I do with Bertrand Russell. Like Rinch, my philosophical research focuses in large part on developing and expanding a logic-centric view of philosophical problems of progress and of solutions. In a sense, my reason for writing about Rinch's work is emotional. I feel that she philosophizes much as I try to do. Her intellectual tendencies feel remarkably close to mine, and I find that personal connection important in making her intellectual con contributions feel significant to me. That philosophical bond leads me to spend my time talking about why others should care about Rinch's work too. More generally, philosophers like Rinch should not be left out of the story, and hopefully you caught a glimpse of how remarkable she was with all these diverse interests and this huge array of publications, uh, and I hope you are left with a strong desire to know more about her from this video, for which you should again see Dr. Marjorie Senecal's I Died for Beauty, which is a fantastic place to start. But as far as the moral for, for uncovering the role that women have played in the history of philosophy, the moral I see is this. 
If a relatively unknown or undiscussed philosopher speaks to you on an emotional or intellectual level, pursue your connection. Uh, it may lead you to find a figure who deserves to be recovered, and more importantly, who has as much in common with you emotionally, intellectually, as one of your good friends. And I certainly feel that way about Rinch. Um, happy International Women's Day, uh, particularly to the women past and present in philosophy.